Okay, all right, so we finished phylum periphera. Yep. And we also talked about these body plan characteristics of animals. Any questions on those before we move on? Because I'm going to be using those terms recurrently to define and describe different phyla. You good with the symmetry? Body layers, diploblastic, triploblastic, and the cavities. Acelomate, pseudocelomate, coelomate. Yep. All right. So we're going to move on to our next phylum, and we're going to go in order of, I guess, the, the time before present that they branched off, they diverged. So the phylum periphera was the first sort of phylum to branch off and diverge. The next one were the Nidarians. And they've diversified into a wide range of different organisms. We're talking about things like the jellies. We can't call them jellyfish anymore, all right? So we call them the jellies. It sounds kind of funny, doesn't it? You think of jello? I don't know. The corals and the hydras and the box jellies and the Portuguese man of wars, things like that, okay? So when we talk about the phylum Nidaria, I want you to think jelly, coral, anemone, hydra, box jellies. What do all those organisms seem to have in common if you just think about them? Did you say weird? <laughs> Maybe. Sorry? Yeah, they live in the water. Good, they're aquatic. Most are marine. What about their body plan? What do they all seem to share? Just think about them. What kind of symmetry they seem to have? Radial symmetry, yeah. They're all sort of round, aren't they? Yeah. All right. So they've got a very simple body plan. First, they're diploblastic. That tells us they have true tissues, and they only had two embryonic germ layers, two proper ones. What would those, what would those two embryonic germ layers be? Good. Yeah. Endoderm and ectoderm. All right. And they've got this radial body plan with radial symmetry. So you can almost think about a Nidarian, your average Nidarian, as a sac with a gastrovascular cavity. Now I'm going to draw it very simply. If here's a sac, draw it round, and now what we're going to do, we're just going to kind of push this part in. There. That's the basic body plan of a Nidarian. Yeah, sac pushed in. And this part we call the gastrovascular cavity. So food goes in. In an animal, where does food typically go in if you ingest it? Yeah, mouth, right. So that acts as a mouth, that opening to the gastrovascular cavity. And of course, wastes, solid or particulate wastes, leave. So this opening acts as both a mouth and an anus. Okay, the gastrovascular cavity. Very, very simple body plan. Okay, everybody okay with that simple body plan? It really is very straightforward, but it's a new term for you, right? This is the gastrovascular cavity. All right, so there you go. The Nidarians branched off second only to the preferens. So this is the basic body plan, but there's two variants on that in the Nidarians. We've got a sessile polyp part to the life cycle and a motile medusoid or medusae stage. And I'll show you diagrams of each of those. So the polyp is attached to a substrate. It's what we mean usually mean by sessile at the aboral or basal end of its body. You okay with that term aboral? That really just means opposite end to the oral end. Okay? And the medusoid stage has got a bell shape its body plan and its mouth is on the underside. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and I'll show you how we can turn that into the polyp stage. We're just going to do this. 
got tentacles. Oh, that's terrible. It's got more tentacles than that. This is the ab oral end where it's attached and there would be an opening and that would be the gastrovascular cavity. So it's this and these have just grown out to be tentacles or arms. Everyone okay with that? Now, for the medusoid stage, we're going to take this and we're going to flip it over like that. Okay? And it's going to be essentially like that. Okay? There's the gastrovascular cavity, gastrovascular cavity. And these also have tentacles, typically around the rim of the bell. Okay? So there's our, what, what do we call this one? The polyp. It's attached sessile and this one is the medusoid, medusoid stage and it's what? Motile. motile. Yep, good. The motile medusae. All right. Now, these can move. They do have muscles. They can contract. If you think about how a jelly moves, you've probably seen them, haven't you? They kind of do this. They move weakly in water currents. So they are capable of some directed movement in response to light, for example. And they do tend to keep their correct side up. But they're also at the mercy of currents. They're not strong swimmers. All right, so here's the diagram that's in your book then, showing the polyp and the medusoid stage. Gastrovascular cavity, you can see in both. Okay. So the gastrodermis then is this layer which lines the gastrovascular cavity and it's in the sort of greeny yellow color in each diagram and that helps you absolutely see where the gastrovascular cavity is because it's lined with the gastrodermis okay so the animal itself on the outside is lined with an epidermis both of them and that's this dark blue layer and then we've got this layer in between okay and with the sponge, what was the sponge, the sort of the gelatinous stuff between? What's that called? Mesa, mesa hill. This is called mesoglia. There are cells in it, but it's not derived from a, an embryonic tissue layer. It's called mesoglia. So we've got our gastrodermis on the inside, our epidermis on the outside, and in the middle, mesoglia. There are cells there, and it's a gelatinous-like layer. It's just not derived from an embryonic, a, a separate embryonic germ layer. All right. They both have tentacles. All right. Both of them have got tentacles. So they're carnivores, the Cnidarians. All right. They're carnivores, which means they pretty much eat other animals, and they use their tentacles to capture their prey. Now, they seem kind of harmless, don't they? jelly-like, yeah? But you've all seen the movie Nemo, haven't you? Yeah? Remember when we went through the big thing of jellyfish? Oh my goodness, that did not like a fun ride. They were getting nailed left, right, and center by stinging cells on the tentacles. And the stinging cells on the tentacles are unique to the Cnidarians. Okay? They're armed with these cells called cnidocytes. And just within the cnidocyte is a structure called a nematocyst. All right. And I'll show you a diagram of this, and I'll show you a video of how they work. But they're unique to the cnidarians. And in some of the cnidarians, the venom really packs a punch. Right. Why do you think they should have, especially some of them, such a toxic venom? What's the role of, of a venom which is so fast-acting and toxic? It doesn't get away. Good choice. Doesn't get away, but I don't know. I mean, snakes. Some snakes have, some snakes don't have venom at all. I know they hold on to the prey. Why, does, why do you think a, an idea in particular would need a, a venom to stop it getting away quickly? Right. There's no structure or strength. Their tentacles are really pretty weak and break <coughs> off easily. Yep. So unless there's very rapid immobilization, the prey knows it's in trouble and can either swim away or get away. All right. Okay. 
So in lab this week, and we'll have it also in when, on Monday's lab, we'll have it also in Wednesday's lab, we've got a model showing one of these nidocytes with a nematocyst. So in the epidermis lining the tentacles, there are these cells, the nidocytes, within which is a nematocyst. So have a look at this one here, the one that's not been triggered. All right, there's a trigger, a little trigger process. It almost looks like a trigger hair. And the nematocyst itself is sort of inverted and coiled inside the cell. All right, and in this little area here is venom. So it's sort of bathed in venom. Now when it's triggered, and I know it's a mechanical trigger when something brushes up against it, but I don't know if there's a chemical trigger as well. I don't. But anyway, something brushes up against it, and this shoots out this thread. All right, it's kind of described as pulling a sock inside out. So it shoots out, and the thread then very quickly penetrates whatever um, its prey item is. The venom gets injected, immobilizes it, and it uses the tentacles just to sort of gently bring the prey, and it pushes it down into the gastrovascular cavity where it digests it. Okay? All right, and here's just another sort of cartoony-like drawing of the nematocyst within the nidocyte. Okay? And you had a chance, you'll have a chance in lab, Monday already has, to look at these, the discharge one on a microscope slide. Okay? And you can see the capsule, the barb, and the thread also. All right, so I want to have a look at this on video. On the larger end, um, so I think they'll eat anything that, anything, any animal that they can actually capture and get stuck in their tentacles. So some will eat fish, right? Some will eat just small. If you're a hydra, for example, these are freshwater. Um, they don't pack a punch. But they might eat some of the um, microplankton, the plankton, the animal-like plankton, the zooplankton that floats around in the water, maybe a little water flea or something like that. So it's going to be the same with some of the very small marine ones. And as you get bigger, then you can get progressively bigger prey. So any animal, they can overpower and take in. If they sting you, it's just an unfortunate accident. They don't want to eat you. Have a look at this one. No, this one. Okay. See how quick that was. Yeah. Play it again. Incredibly fast, isn't it? Lots of them fire. See the density. Boom. Yep. Why is it that some of the smaller jellies, like a box jelly? Has such a potent venom so, so small. I really don't know the answer to that, but I tell you that there are some patterns. Generally, the smaller and sort of like physically weak you are, generally the more you pack, the bigger the punch you pack with venom. All right? The bigger, more muscly you are, the less of a venom punch you've got to pack. So a rough general rule. So all I can think of the box jellies, they just evolved. They have very long tentacles, many of them. I imagine they're very delicate, you know, they're very weakly floating. Um, I imagine it's just a way to immobilize very quickly for an animal which is you know, relatively weak and has those long, very breakable tentacles.
So the phylum Cnidaria then is divided into four major classes. I'm only going to talk about three of them in any depth, but I'll mention the fourth. All right. So in lab, we only looked at, mainly looked at three of those classes, not so much the four. So I'm going to go over the, this phylum class by class. All right. So the first class are the Hydrozoans. The class name is Hydrozoa. Then we've got the Scyphozoans. Class name is Scyphozoa. And the Cubozoans, this is the one that I'm not going to talk about in super depth. And then we've got the Anthozoans or class Anthozoa. All right. So four classes, I'm mostly going to talk about one, two, and four, and just mention three briefly. All right, so first the Hydrozoans then. So most Hydrozoans, they alternate between a polyp, it's this one, and the medusoid stage in their life cycle. All right. And a good example, a sort of quintessential example of a hydrozoan is this organism called Obelia. That's the genus name. And it's a really good example of an organism that exists in its polyp and its medusoid stage. And again, we looked at those in lab under the microscope. Hydra is the name of a freshwater Cnidarian. And it almost exclusively exists as the polyp stage okay so it doesn't really have a medusoid stage or the stage that it has is very 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 short-lived its primary stage is this polyp stage all right so i googled the word hydra and this is what i came up with it's not doesn't look like this at all does it no all right so be really careful when you google terms that you don't know the meaning of all right. If you don't know what Hydra is, you Googled it and you got this. Oh, it's some lizard-like creature with wings and, I don't know, half a dozen heads. Yep. So just be cautious of that. Google is a fantastic way to figure out, I guess, the definition of many terms. But if you're really not clued in with what the term should mean, Google can send you completely in the opposite direction. That's what a Hydra looks like. Okay. Quite small, fresh water. Does anybody know what aquatic plant this specimen is attached to? You've seen it in 181. It's Elodea, good. Elodea, it's a pondweed. Yep, and it's just attached to it. That gives you an idea of the scale. Yep, this is actually quite a big hydra because those leaves are about a centimetre long. It's a big one. So, you can see the mouth also acts as the anus. Within this, the body, you've got the gastrovascular cavity. There's the tentacles, all of them lined with the nematocyst. And what's going on here? Budding, yeah, so it's asexual reproduction by budding. Okay, so this will just break off, float away, attach on its aboral end, and then it will form another hydra, genetically identical. So this graphic just shows that kind of asexual reproduction. It will get a little bud, it will develop into what looks like a mini adult, that will fall off, maybe float away, attach, and you get another hydra. It's one of the ways that we're able to reproduce. But they can also reproduce sexually. So these little red bumps here are gonads, and they're kind of going to produce sperm and eggs. So when do you think a hydra might reproduce sexually like this? Think about it, when it might reproduce asexually by budding versus sexually. So that might be important if there's a group of them. Because you'd want, ideally, to have outbreeding, not inbreeding, but the sperm can fertilize the eggs of the same individual. Okay? Think about what environmental conditions might promote one over the other. Diversity. Mm, I'm not sure about that one. I really don't. An overabundance of food? Or an abundance of food? Or maybe the other way around. don't know about food availability. I really don't. Think about this. If you're going to reproduce by budding, do you think these are robust animals that can tolerate drought and all those other sort of harsh conditions that a short-lived pool of water might go through? No. They're fresh water, maybe ponds, streams, lakes. If that pond, stream or lake dries up, what do you think happens to the adult hydra? Dies. 
so would the little babies that are produced by budding. All right? And sometimes these ephemeral pools, these ephemeral bodies of water are very short-lived. They might dry up. When you reproduce sexually, sperm fertilizes an egg. Oftentimes that egg will develop. Sometimes they develop into a very, very robust, very long-lived cyst stage, all right? Which can just sink down to the bottom of the pool or pond or lake, right? And it just stays there. And then as soon as conditions are appropriate, it may then hatch and form another hydra. But when that pond or lake dries up, that can be the resistant stage which is just present in the dust at the bottom of that pool or pond. And it can stay viable sometimes for years, that little cyst. All right? So sometimes adverse conditions trigger a hydra to reproduce sexually. Maybe you start to get evaporation, the salinity starts to go up, and then the hydra senses that, and maybe it reproduces sexually in that way. All right. So I want to take you through then the life cycle of obelia okay so this is what the diagram of obelia looks like and over here it's what it might look like through the microscope and this is a different kind of microscopy than what we've been doing it's dark field so the background is black and this appears sort of very light color and it grows as a colony in fact it almost looks like a plant doesn't it except it's not green There's no green parts to it although sometimes they'll feed on algae trick you you know, and it might look a little bit green. So, on these branches, we've got a colony of polyps, okay? And they just look like hydra, like mini hydras in a colony. Yep, there's the tentacles, there's the mouse slash anus, gastrovascular cavity in there. Now, some of these polyps are reproductive polyps, and they'll re release these tiny little medusae that are really small, into the water and the medusae same as on a, a big jelly they've got gonads some of them will release sperm some of them will release eggs sperm fertilizes the eggs you get a zygote we go through all the developmental stages we already talked about and of course this then develops into a larva the larva into a polyp and you get a whole new colony growing is everyone okay with that? So you see how we go from medusa to polyp stage, and they're both present in the life cycle. What do you think is the purpose of these medusoid stages, one of them? Travel. Yeah, dispersal, right? It's like you, when you get to 18, your parents kick you out and say, all right, go somewhere else, make your own living. It's exactly what's going on. All right, so this is what the microscope slides that we had in lab look like. All right, they're really pretty clear. Here you can see the tentacles, and there's the feeding polyps. And you, it's just a classic polyp. And in these ones, you can see the little medusae starting to develop. And when they're released, they all come, like, swimming out almost. They're kind of emitted one at a time. They just pop out and swim off by themselves. And they look just like that, like a tiny little miniature jelly. All right. Everybody okay with the hydrozoans then? Yeah. What would you say is a characteristic feature of the class hydrozoa? They are small, but many of them are. But you're right, they are small. Both. Both the polyp and the medusoid stage are present. Now, I know hydra is a little bit of an exception to that. Okay? But they both alternate between these. Okay. All right. <clears throat> the Scyphozoans then, class Scyphozoa. So these are the quintessential jellies, or what you used to call jellyfish, right, that you think about. And it's the medusoid stage in this class, which is the prevalent form of the life cycle. It's the dominant form. It's what is present virtually all of the time. Okay. So in terms of a characteristic that's almost diagnostic of this class, mostly present as medusoid stage. That's the dominant form of the life cycle. And we commonly call them jellyfish, although the marine biologists don't like that. So we used to call them jellies. And our sort of quintessential jelly is the one we looked at in lab. It's in the genus Aurelia. Anybody been stung by a jelly? Just curious. A couple of you? Was it painful? 
Yeah? Where was it? I'm just curious. Yeah. Did you see them? I didn't see them, but uh, I felt it. Were they small? How big were they? <coughs> I think they were really small. Yeah. <coughs> what you? It was in Florida as well. It was um, <coughs> right after a hurricane, so they were kind of blown in huh? or something. I don't know. I actually don't know if you were blown in or something. Huh? It hurt really bad. So that's sort of Aurelia, right? The quintessential jelly. And you can see, what would we call these structures here? Tentacles, and this is the rim of the bell where the tentacles attach. What are these structures, these horseshoe-like structures? There's four of them, those of you from lab. If you've not had lab yet, you wouldn't know. Lab folks? Gonads. So there's gonads, and then kind of within that little horseshoe is a gastric pouch. It's part of the gastrovascular cavity that forms like a little pouch. All right. And you can see you've got these canals as well. Yep, these little radial canals which come out and branch. Okay. Now I found these images and I don't know what they're of. I don't know how they were taken. They almost look like x-rays to me, but they're too perfectly regular. It seems like to be of a real, a real jelly. But they really show some of the parts, the body parts, very, very well. So we've got these oral arms that hang down. Okay. They would be used to sort of grab, hold, but they're not muscular. Don't think of them like an octopus's arms, but they would be used to pull the prey into the mouth. Here we've got the tentacles with the stinging cells. There we've got those, usually on Aurelia, four of those horse-shaped structures, which have the gonads and the surrounding gastric pouches. And then we've got this here. See that little dark structure and another one there, and they're evenly spaced throughout around the bell. I'll show you another diagram with them. Oh, here's a top view. And again, you can see gonad, gastric pouch, gonad, gastric pouch, gonad, gastric pouch. Okay? So this is a view from the underside. Shows the mouth, oral arms, rim of the bell, and then the tentacles. And I can show you better here. See that little light structure there? You can see it on the monitor where the, where the cursor is, just there. Can you see that? There's another one there. How many has it got? It's got eight of them, all right? They're called repallium, repallia, singular repallium, all right? And there you can see them quite nicely. Little structure there, little structure there, little structure there, structure there. They're very simple, but they, within that repallium, there are structures that are able to sense light and gravity. All right? So it's a way for the animal to know whether it's the right way up or not, because they respond to gravity. And it's a way for the animal to respond to both light and dark. All right? Okay, and there's a close-up of them. Very, very, very simple structures, but they're sense organs. And there's another just cross cut of the jelly. Okay. Everybody okay with those structures? Yeah, I think they're quite straightforward. All right, so if they're armed with nematocysts and venom, what have they got to fear? Sea turtles. Yeah, sea turtles. That's a great video. We're going to look at this. Should listen to the ads. Stop my car! You talk, it starts. Remote start on the all new Hyundai Elantra. Did you just talk start that car? I just wanted to hug him. I was gonna eat him. Thought you were vegan. Back to Machite, so I'll just eat around it.
There are not a lot of nutrients in a jelly. Yeah. They have pretty tough scales, but the eyes are a sensitive part. Yeah. I really don't know how painful that is in terms of swallowing, right? We sort of look at it and say, oh, it's got to be terribly painful. But I've seen elephants eat trees that have thorns that are about two inches long. Cows eat prickly pear pads, you know, with, with needles on that are really long. And they just seem to eat them without a problem. I've seen giraffes wrap their tongue around acacia trees, just kind of suck the leaves off and leave the thorns. So um, I don't know how painful it is. We tend to really sort of anthropomorphize, don't we? And say, oh, that must be terrible. Maybe it tastes good. I don't know. Why are they called green sea turtles? Anyone know? Did that look green? They do have some algae growing on the outside of them, but honestly, it's because the meat inside is greenish. They feed on a lot of algae, and the meat inside gets green. That's why they're called green sea turtles. Okay, so where do you find jellies? Out in the ocean, yeah. So this is a picture, it's on a boat on the, off, just off the coast of Namibia. So it was on one of the Africa study abroads, and this is a group of students that went one year, and it was an awesome boat trip. We went out to see seals, there's a huge colony of Cape fur seals, just enormous numbers of animals, making lots of noise and a big fuss. And we saw um, dolphins or porpoises as well, um, it was really cool. But we also saw, oh, this is one of the other instructors actually, and we were feeding seagulls with fish off the boat. I think that look of pain on his um, face is seagulls actually have quite sharp beaks. You see that little red there? So it was a very enthusiastic seagull, and it, I think, took a chunk out of him as well as took the fish. But I got that picture just at the right moment. Any, did anybody take 181 from Lewis Obermiller? No, well, that's Lewis Obermiller. It's right? so one of our other instructors. But the ocean was filled with jellies, and I mean loads of them. And these things were about, oh, about 30 centimeters to about 45 centimeters in diameter. They were huge, and it was filled with them. So I don't know what sort of hazard that presented to the animals. Um, I don't know if the seals would get stung through their fur or on their faces, or how venomous these were, but it was really a sight to see. All right, so class number three, the Cubozoans. <coughs> these are kind of an, an oddball group, really. So this includes the box jellies, the sea wasps. And these ones have got quite complex eyes, at least for a cnidarian. And these are the ones with the super toxic cnidocytes. So when you get stung by these, these really pack a punch. You get stung enough, and it can lead to death. Really ruin your day. So many aquariums, many of the really nice aquariums in California have um, collections with these box jellies in. All right? And they're, it's really worth going to see. They're the very long tentacles. And they're kind of almost like a, a colony of almost different organisms or cells grouped together. It's almost like a colony, colonial. All right? But they're the ones that are really super venomous. So I think that's a very brave scuba diver. I guess he's well covered up or knows what they're doing. But because you get stung enough, it can kill you. All right, so I think this picture was taken um, by someone who was swimming and killed by stings from box jellies off the coast of Australia. <coughs> All right, so on to the class Anthozoa then. Just spend a little bit more time on these. So the Anthozoans, class Anthozoa, includes the corals and the sea anemones. And Organisms in this class only exist in their polyp stage. They've lost the medusoid stage. 
So that would be a diagnostic feature of this class. Only exists as a polyp state. They've lost the medusoid stage. And you're familiar with corals, especially the hard corals. Not all corals are hard, form that calcareous exoskeleton, but many of them do. And you're familiar with the anemones as well. Thanks to Nemo. So some of these um, corals look green or greenish in colour. And it's because they form a symbiosis with algae. So the algae live within them for a short period of time. I don't think the algae reproduce very much because they need to keep recruiting algae. Um, but presumably they're, they're getting something from that relationship. They're getting photosynthates from the algae to supplement um, their nutrition. But many of them form a very hard exoskeleton made of calcium carbonate, and that forms the hard corals that you're familiar with. All right, so what's this guy? Coral or anemone? Anemone, it's huge, all right, really big. You can see the mouth slash anus, you can see the tentacles, and so on. There's another anemone, and another one. They're really pretty, sometimes nice colors. And of course, they're the ones that Nemo lives in. Why doesn't Nemo mind? Yeah, there's a very thick mucus layer, all right? And it seems to either inhibit or stop the nematocysts from getting through, or they're just tolerant of the venom or a mix of both. Yeah? I think it's what it is, like, the, the enemy, the enemy is they, they test things by kind of feeling what their, their, well, their pheromones are. So they secrete the same pheromones that the anemone does, so they think they're feeling the same thing. So they think they're feeling another anemone when it's actually clownfish. So you mean they're not getting stung at all? No. Oh, I didn't know that. All right, that's awesome. So they're faking the anemone out. So that would tell you it's not just a mechanical trigger, it must be a chemical trigger as well. Huh? All right, so coral reefs then. Coral reefs are hugely important. And that makes anthozoans hugely important. They can form enormous marine structures that have been built upon over thousands and thousands of years. So here's a satellite image. Look at the extent of this coral reef. It's huge, absolutely enormous. And of course, when sea level historically was much higher, the coral reefs will be built up. In this image, obviously, sea levels have dropped since those coral reefs were built up. Yep. And you can see the, you know, some. Some of it obviously comes up above the level of the ocean. It's fairly lifeless in terms of coral life when it's outside of the water, but the rest of the coral below is going to hopefully doing just fine. So this is a coral atoll. And atolls are these islands by themselves that are formed from coral. So again, go back far enough in time when sea level was much higher. These coral reefs were being built up and up and up and up sea levels dropped, and that's how some of these islands form. And of course, when you've got enough of this coral above the water level, then you're going to start to get colonization by land plants, you're going to get soil built up, and you're going to get animals presumably to colonize and find that area. So some islands are not rock, they're coral. There are some islands off the coast of Kenya. One of them is called Lamu, another one's called, I think, called Pemba, and I've been there. And you walk around, and there's hardly any soil, but it's just old coral you're walking on. That's the substrate, not rock. And they actually cut that up, and they use it for construction, just the same as what they would um, rock to build houses and so on. It's amazing, really. So the, what, the biological diversity on coral reefs is incredibly high. So coral reefs are really, really important as a place where we've got a huge reservoir of biodiversity. So what's the big deal about biodiversity? I don't know, is it of any use to us? Do we use our biodiversity in any way? We're going to talk about biodiversity in the last sort of quarter of the semester. What would be one of our uses of biodiversity? How do we benefit from this biodiversity on a coral reef, for example? Food. Food. Yep, we do. Organisms that live there, we eat. And you only eat other organisms. Or things derived from other organisms. A bottle of Pepsi is not an other organism, right? But presumably it's derived mostly from other organisms. What else? What could be another benefit of the biodiversity on a coral reef? Could there be treatments for illness? 
Yeah, absolutely. So there's a group at ASU, I don't know if he's still doing it, but they would go out into these tropical islands, what a job, and collect sponges of all things. I think it's because sponges, I think it was because they don't get cancer. There's no known cancer in sponges, or they produce a whole bunch of interesting chemicals. They would go out and collect these sponges, they would bring them back to the lab, and they would run them through chemical screens to see if they produce anti-cancer compounds that we can use. If we've got the biodiversity and preserved the biodiversity, then presumably we've got a wide range of species of sponges, and within each species, lots of variation between individuals. So that gives us the biggest pool to draw from when we're trying to find pharmaceutical chemicals. Without that biodiversity, the pool is very small. Okay. So there's a coral up close, one of the hard corals, with the polyp extending through little holes in the hard calcareous exoskeleton. And when you remove all of the live soft tissue, you're just left with that calcareous exoskeleton, and that's what it looks like. Lots of different species of corals have lots of different shape and patterns to their exoskeleton. That's what it looks like close up. And you can see the little holes, can't you, where the polyp would poke through and it would live within. So why do you think they make this hard exoskeleton? What's the role of that? Protection. Yeah, protection for sure. And of course it builds upon, it grows. They build upon it. All right, so that extends and that enables them to grow. So coral reefs then are hugely important. Can't underscore their importance. So they house exceptional biodiversity. We estimate there are one to eight million undiscovered species still on coral reefs. They provide food. They provide the basis for many fisheries because even though the fish that live on a coral reef or the organisms that live on a coral reef may not be edible, they provide food to bigger organisms that are and that we fish. And they buffer shorelines. So many shorelines have extensive coral reefs and that buffers them from storms. Very important. So think about this. Globally, each second we dump over a thousand tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. What kind of activities dump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere? Burning fossil fuels, Burning fossil fuels is, is huge. It's one of the biggest ones. Animal yep. Agriculture. Sorry? Animal agriculture. Which? Animal agriculture. Yeah, agricultural. Agricultural practices do as well. All right, and about, so that's each second. And then about 300 tonnes of that carbon dioxide dissolves into the oceans. So carbon dioxide is quite soluble in water. Yep. And when carbon dioxide dissolves in water, what does it form? Anyone know? Which? Carbonic acid. Carbonic acid, a very weak acid. In fact, you can take some deionized water from the lab, take a beaker, put a straw in the beaker, and a pH probe. Measure the pH of the water out the tap, and then blow into it with a straw. And pretty quickly, over about 30 seconds, the pH drops. to You can get it down to about pH 4. Just the carbon dioxide in your exhaled breath dissolving into the water, forming that weak carbonic acid. Now, the oceans aren't pH 4, thank goodness. But with all of that carbon dioxide dissolving into the oceans, what do you think has happened to the pH of the oceans? It's getting slightly more acidic. Now, the exoskeleton of these corals is what? Calcium carbonate, primarily, is one of the primary substances. So what happens if you add an acid to calcium carbonate? Any rock jocks in the room? What does it do? Neutralize it. Starts to dissolve it. The geologist, if you ever go out to the field with a geologist, they carry two things. What are two things they carry? One of these little geological hammers, right? A little hammer to tap at the rocks. And a little jar of acid. I don't know what acid is. But they want to know if it's a calcium carbonate based rock. So they take the rock they're interested in, they drip a little bit of the acid on. If it fizzes, then they know, up, oh, it's a calcium carbonate based rock, so there's calcium carbonate in there. It's one of their diagnostic tools. So it reacts with it, right? It's why acid rain starts to dissolve away buildings made of limestone. So we're acidifying the oceans, we're changing the flux of 
we're changing the solubility of the calcium carbonate and we find that these coral reefs are starting to go away as a result. Slowly but surely, coral reefs are being destroyed. They're dying off and the coral that's left behind is starting to re uh, reduce in mass. It's a real problem. All right. On that gloomy note, any questions about Nidarians? Nope. Okay. Is there anything you can do? Do you think anything you can do to save a coral reef or help reduce coral reef destruction? Sorry? You're not kidding. Ride a bike. Right? Or maybe don't do unnecessary journeys. Yep. Or to decide where you go on vacation, you're going to maybe go, I don't know, scuba diving at a place that's a sport that supports sustainable ecotourism on coral reefs. Yep. Okay. All right. So, phylum Nideria. What are the diagnostic features of this phylum? Always start with body plan. Always start there. Tell me what body plan features this phylum has. Radial symmetry. Radial symmetry. And they're diploblastic. All right, now give me some of their sort of unique biology. They're carnivorous, but many of them are. I would put that very low down on the diagnostic tier. Nematocysts. They have nematocysts. Only phylum to have nematocysts, yep. Nematocysts within nidocytes. Good, stinging cells. What else? That pretty much defines the phylum. Give me some more. Good, polypermedusoid stages. Yep, that's it. You've done it. Define the phylum. Good characteristics. Okay. On exams, practical exam and in class exam, I'm definitely going to ask you what characteristics define the phylum. All right? And I want you to start off with the body plan characteristics and then robust characteristics unique to that phylum, ideally. Okay. All right.